Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the Fast Friday edition of the show for September 9th. 2022. And today in history, in 1774, Patriots in Massachusetts unanimously passed something that almost no one has ever heard of today, the Suffolk Resolves. And of course, this has been completely thrown down the memory hole because it is part of our forgotten foundation. And I think for this one, maybe it's because it's a really good blueprint on how to take on the largest government on Earth. So on this episode, I'll do a little bit of background, and then I've got some highlights of the resolves, primarily written by Patriot and Dr. Joseph Warren, and they include things like noncompliance, tax resistance, ignoring the courts, and even a little free market-based dispute resolution through arbitration. I'll get to all that in just a moment, but first, a quick hello and a huge thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one, I can't thank you enough. And if you want to follow along with the stuff that I'm mentioning, other articles and uh, source documents, episodes, things like that that I mention in each episode, well, you got to follow us over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I publish a blog post for each episode with all the links and all the different platforms are on about one to two hours after the live stream is done. So make sure to follow us over there. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this info out to you in the next 10 to 15 minutes. I want to first start out with a little background and hear from an article we published by Mike Meharry. Just this morning, it will be linked to in the show notes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. He writes, the British Parliament passed a series of acts together known as the Coercive Acts in early 1774. You may have heard them called the Intolerable Acts. They didn't call it that back then, but they were uh, passed to punish the colonies. Think of the name, the Coercive Acts. They're trying to coerce the colonies, but almost solely, primarily Massachusetts. And this was after the Boston Tea Party. These included, here are the acts, the Boston Port Act, which closed the Boston Port, the Massachusetts Government Act, stripping virtually all authority from the colonial government, the Administration of Justice Act, stripping authority from local courts, and authorizing trials to be held in Great Britain. So if the if uh, the empire thought that you couldn't get a fair trial in Massachusetts, maybe because too many people in Massachusetts were involved and they weren't going to get the prosecution they want, they might ship you off to another part of the empire for that trial. Pretty crazy. And then you have the quartering acts, which allowed priv- to allow private uh, buildings to be taken over to allow uh, British troops to be put there. And that wasn't just specifically for Massachusetts, but the rest pretty much were. So in response to this, here we have from AmericanHistoryCentral.com, the people of Massachusetts began to plan for the worst. They thought this was pretty bad, and they were right. Many of the towns throughout the colony were in the habit of storing weapons and ammunition in storehouses throughout the colony, including the provincial powder house on Quarry Hill in Charlestown. Slowly and quietly, the towns began removing their weapons and ammo from the storehouses. The reason was these were basically run by the government and they wanted to put it into private hands, uh, into the hands of the people. So the British couldn't come in and do a gun control program, which is exactly what General Gage wanted to do. And that's how Mike put it in an article talking about the powder alarm, which happened uh, at the beginning of September 1774. And this is an important part of this entire story. Mike writes that. Thomas Gage, General Gage, was appointed the military governor of Massachusetts and thinking the best way to keep the peace would be to disarm the colonists as much as possible. He set in motion a scheme to secretly remove military equipment, including guns and powder, guns and gunpowder from storehouses across New England. So they were really on it. The people, the the militia, the colonists, the patriots, patriots, the whatever you want to call them, they were aware of what was coming. And this actually resulted at the beginning of September into a false alarm of a hot war. They had done some seizure of some government owned gunpowder, but word got out that there was some shooting that actually didn't happen. But in response, as many as about 20,000 militia members from the surrounding area and states showed up to deal with it in the first few days of September. So on the heels of what became known as this powder alarm, when the colonists were literally already taking up arms to challenge the British, we start having preparation 
four more steps. And Mike writes that committees of correspondence, and of course, we know that those were established in Massachusetts uh, as far back as 1772 by Samuel Adams. But these committees of cor correspondence from Suffolk, Middlesex, Essex, and Worcester, I always get that wrong, counties in Massachusetts met in Boston to formulate a response. On a local level, the Suffolk County Convention, which included the city of Boston, or still does, to discuss the matter was initially scheduled for August 18th, 1774. So they were already going to deal with the coercive acts. And then you had this seizure of gunpowder and a bunch of people showing up with arms to challenge the British. So they reconvened again because a number of people couldn't make it in August, but they reconvened right after that on September 6th. And Mike writes that when the convention convened on that day, Dr. Joseph Warren introduced the first draft of the Suffolk Resolves. It went through some edits, not really major at all. And Samuel Adams, he noted, had worked with Warren behind the scenes to organize the convention and draft the proposed resolutions. In a letter in August, while they were waiting for the actual meeting to happen, Warren wrote to Adams saying, quote, I shall take care to follow your advice respecting the county meet county meeting which depending upon it will have very important consequences the spirit of our friends rise every day so they were expecting something pretty big and then after some debate and a few edits as i mentioned it passed unanimously again today in history september 9th 1774 now they specifically focused on the coercive acts as the cause of the current crisis that was happening there in Massachusetts. There was no mention of taxation or taxation without representation or trade rules or any of that other stuff that may have been part of the entire, uh, the entire story. It was the laws that Parliament passed to compel obedience, in essence, that was causing the current disobedience. The more that they tried to coerce, the more resistance that they met. And they really captured the radical sentiment of the people at that time in that area. Here, just in the preamble, here's a, a few highlights. If a boundless extent of continent swarming with millions will tamely submit to live, move, and have their being at the arbitrary will of a licentious minister, they basely yield to voluntary slavery and future generations shall load their memories with incessant execrations. In other words, mass compliance helps establish tyranny, tyranny, not just over the people who are complying, but millions yet unborn. And people who continue to comply and uh, establish the precedent of more and more government power, they're certainly a big part of the problem. We have to think about that today. Going further from that preamble, they write that on the other hand, if we arrest the hand which would ransack our pockets, if we disarm the parasite which points the dagger to our bosoms, if we nobly defeat that fatal edict which proclaims a power to frame laws for us in all cases whatsoever. You've heard me talk about this many, many times. The revolution wasn't about taxation without representation. John Hancock, for example, specifically addressed this issue, this question for us today in one of his um, in one of these massacre day orations commemorating the ma commemorating the massacre. In Boston, he specifically said this is just taxation. This issue here is really just an outgrowth of British claims to have power over us, quote, in all cases whatsoever. And that's how Dr. Joseph Warren put it as well. And the Suffolk resolves that ended up in there as well. And again, goes on. It says if we successfully resist that unparalleled usurpation of con unconstitutional power, then in essence, and they go through a bunch of other things. You should read this. Of course, I will link to it in the show notes. Then we in our current time, no matter how difficult the odds may seem, we can help establish freedom and happiness for millions yet unborn for future generations. But here, let's go to the, some of the resolves. Here's from number two. It is an indispensable duty. This resistance is an indispensable duty, which we owe to God, our countries, ourselves, and posterity. 
And the third resolve is, in a, I guess, a precursor to nullification efforts in the years to follow and maybe some efforts today. They, in essence, declared the acts unconstitutional. They're saying this violates, even though it was an unwritten constitution, but also the charter of Massachusetts Bay. But they're saying we're taking the position that this is unconstitutional and therefore void. Because if we think about what James Otis Jr. had to say at the beginning of the revolution and thought in 1761, in his arguments against the writs of assistance, he said an act against the constitution is void. So here from the the third resolve, they say, the late acts of the British Parliament are gross infractions of those rights to which we are justly entitled by the laws of nature, the British Constitution, and the Charter of the Pro Province. So it's a violation of our natural rights. That's the first thing. We're born with these rights. And the fact that they do this, well, that's a violation of that. And then on top of it, the British Constitution, and then our written charter here for uh, Massachusetts. And then the next one is talking about disobedience. Number four, no obedience is due from this province to either or any part of the acts above mentioned, but that they be, be rejected as the attempts of a wicked administration to enslave America. If they go beyond the limits of the constitution, it isn't about waiting for the government to say, okay, we violated the constitution, we're violating natural law, we're violating your liberty, we're violating your provincial charter, and yeah, we see the light and we're going to stop. No, they're saying no obedience is due to these people as long as they continue to do these types of things. And then go on, they actually address the courts. They specifically say, well, if they're going to replace our courts with their own appointed ministers, and we know how that's going to play out, we don't have to obey them either. So long as the justices are appointed, they say, they must be considered as under undue influence and are therefore unconstitutional officers. And as such, no regard ought to be paid to them by the people of this county. And they want the sheriffs to know that the people have their back. So if the sheriffs do the right thing and act as representatives of the people, peace officers for the people defending the Constitution, well, the people will support them. This county, and this is a resolution or resolve number six, this county will support and bear harmless all sheriffs and their deputies, constables, jurors, and other officers who shall refuse to carry into execution the orders of said courts. And for my ANCAP friends, or those who are kind of, you know, ANCAP adjacent, in the absence of a government court system, of course, they're probably concerned. There was some discussion, and Joseph Warren included this in his draft. There was some discussion, well, how do we deal with controversies that come up? Well, they call for the people to just figure out how to resolve them. But they recognize that that isn't how it will always play out. It always isn't going to play out with people just being honest. So they included this in the sixth resolve as well. If any disputes relative to debts or trespasses shall arise, which cannot be settled by the parties, we recommend it to them to submit all such cases to arbitration. So free market arbitration instead of government forced courts. And they say it is our opinion on top of this that the contending parties of either of them who shall refuse so to do ought to be considered as cooperating with the enemies of this country. So if you go to the government courts that isn't approved by the people who live there, then and you don't use arbitration to resolve a dispute that you can't get to. Well, then you're working with the bad guys. You are cooperating. You're a collaborator working with the enemies of the country. And then next up, we have tax resistance in, I mean, it, the hits just keep coming. And I'm only going through the highlights. There's more to this than I'm covering. These are the best parts of it. But resolve number seven, that it be recommended to the collectors of taxes, constables, and all other officers who have public monies in their hands to retain the same and not to make any payment thereof to the provincial county treasurer until the civil government of the province is placed upon a constitutional foundation. Now, this is kind of a precursor to, and this is a total aside to how some people have suggested the state should today respond to federal violations of the constitution, which are constant, the largest government in history. And that is, 
well, maybe we'll step in and interpose against the tax collecting ability of the federal government. And when you get back to the Constitution, we'll divvy some tax money out to you based on how close you are to following that. It's similar and maybe it's a precursor, but they're basically saying we're going to withhold all the taxes. Or we're encouraging this to happen. We're recommending that and encouraging people to take part in that. And then once you get back to a constitutional foundation, then we will start to comply once again. They also called for all kinds of other stuff. They demanded that people resign. So if once the uh, the assembly was suspended through the Massachusetts Government Act, there, then the the the. Empire basically appointed people to a council and they said, well, if you're on that, you really should resign. And if not, you're enemies to this country. Uh, they called for a replacement of all officers of the militia to ensure that they weren't loyal to the crown and they were loyal to the people and to their natural rights. They called for people to do more training, at least on a weekly basis, and to expand the people under arms, expand the militia. They called for a boycott of all British goods, which we know is a huge part of the protests and the resistance to the empire at the time. And while the resolves were really local in nature, they did have a pretty big impact. And let me pull this up from allthingsliberty.com. I don't know who the author was off the top of my head, but Paul Revere, in one of his lesser known rides, they were all very important, but one of his lesser known rides on September 11th, 1774, he carried the Suffolk resolves to Philadelphia, where the first Continental Congress was meeting. And he said, when Revere arrived on September 16, Congress had been meeting for 12 days. Debates revealed a split between radicals and moderates, but Revere's news of the revolution underway in Massachusetts tilted the scales. The next day on the 17th, Congress unanimously endorsed the Suffolk Resolves, with even moderates like Joseph Galloway, Galloway forced to vote in favor. It was really the first official act of the first Continental Congress. John Adams in his diary thought this was such a glorious day. He said, this was one of the happiest days of my life. In Congress, we had generous, noble sentiments and manly eloquence. This day convinced me that America will support the Massachusetts or perish with her. And Silas Dean that same day, I think this was a letter to his wife back in Connecticut. He said, I send the results of this day, which are applauded to the skies by the inhabitants of this city. Now, one of the reasons that the resolves are so noteworthy is because they basically declared that at least in Massachusetts, the war for independence had really begun. It hadn't turned into a hot shooting war, but they were making the preparations and moving in that direction to respond. And Samuel Adams back and forth with Joseph Warren in some letters, you can see he was encouraging them to stay on the defensive there in Boston. And then with the Declaration Resolves of the First Continental Congress and the Continental Association, which both passed in October, uh, they learned that they weren't alone. I will link to an episode on those uh, resolves of the First Continental Congress, which I have up on the screen here as well, over at TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash Path to Liberty. So noncompliance, resistance to the courts even, calling on sheriffs to refuse to enforce uh, the acts of the parliament, tax resistance, and even this kind of free market arbitration to avoid using the government courts. These are some serious responses, building up the militia, training and the like, that I think almost all of them, well, very few of them are people really working on today. And I think we really should pay more attention. I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. We want to get this kind of message out to more and more people every day, and nothing helps us get that job done more than the financial faith and support of our members. If you want to help us reach and teach more people about the Constitution and liberty and how to defend both when government refuses to do so, which is constantly, you can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Well, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you learned something today, and I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.